and renew a right spirit. Because you said in your word that if we would humble ourselves, turn from our wicked way, seek your face, that you'd heal the land, heal the land. And our land needs healing. It's a xenophobic land. It's a land of capitalism and marginalization and discrimination. It's a land of hurt. A land of harm. A land where all lives don't matter. Contrary to what they say, but we're thankful, oh God, that our lives, all lives matter to you. That some people try to social distance from other cultures, other ethnicities, from people who are different from them. They try to social distance with policies and practices. But I thank you, oh God, that you don't social distance from us even when we are jacked up from the floor. But you still tabernacle with us. And for that we say thank you and glory to your name. Our strong God, we ask that you would have your way in our lives and in our worship. Be glorified in all that we say, all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. And you give God praise for the praise team as they come. Because you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ever ask to think, God. We, we give you glory. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. God, we thank you for continuing to pull us through. Whatever it is that we're going to do through, God, you continue to have your hand adjacent to us, God, so that we can continue to lift our hands up and grab on so you can pull us out of what we're going through. Yes, Lord. And we give you glory, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Jesus. Thank you. We bless your name, God. You're worthy of the glory, God. And we're worthy of the honor, God. And we give you glory. Hallelujah. Sit through all. Yeah, yeah. I have gone through. Said, Lord, it was you. Sit through. up your voice and say, sit through
to pull them up and the mind to know to put them on your feet and to pull them up. So we give God praise because we are cognizant of the fact that it was He that has pulled, brought us through. Hallelujah. Gracious God, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you for the blessings of life, the blessings of this day. We thank you for this preaching moment, this worship experience. And our strong God, we come before you because we are cognizant of the fact that without you, we can do nothing. Oh, but with you, we can do all things. So I pray like the psalmist that you would allow us to behold great wonders out of your law. I pray like the Apostle Paul that you would allow me to preach, not with enticing words of my own wisdom, but in the demonstration of your Holy Spirit and power, that I might make known the mysteries of your gospel. To the end, O oh God, that you and you alone are glorified and magnified. The saints are edified and multiplied. Satan is horrified and petrified. And sinners become justified in Jesus' name. If you have your Bibles or your copy of the Word of God, would you go with us to Psalm 51? Psalm number 51. I'm going to read a few verses of this psalm in your hearing from the New, New International Version of God's Word, uh, beginning at verse 1. The prescript says, for the director of music, a psalm of David. When the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Black out my transgressions and wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. And against you, and you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. My brothers and sisters, for the next few moments that's ours to share, I simply want to talk to you from this thought, this theme. Accident forgiveness. Accident forgiveness. A friend of mine bought a new car recently, and the new car has a rear view camera. And my friend was not accustomed to a rear view camera or a camera of any kind in the car because the car they had prior uh, did not have any of the modern technology of rear view and front view or side view cameras. And they were backing out of a parking space when they started to get too close to the car behind them uh, because they were trying to use the rear view camera, or as they call it, the backup camera. And my brothers and sisters, when they started to get too close to the car uh, behind them, their car began to beep to notify them that, hey, you're getting too close, pump the brakes. But it was all too new and all too much. And before they knew it, they had bagged into somebody else's car. And my brothers and sisters, it was bad enough that they had wrecked their new car. Uh, but their insurance had already gone to extortion rates because of the new car. And now they were afraid that they would, be get, they would get dropped by their insurance company. But my brothers and sisters, when they went to the mailbox a few weeks later expecting a cancellation letter, when they opened it, to their surprise, the letter said something like, Gee, sorry to hear you in, a, in an accident. Well, they do happen. No worries, though. We're going to keep your premium the same. Just be more careful next time. And that's exactly what many auto insurance companies are doing. It's called accident forgiveness. And it's the hottest marketing tool in the insurance, auto insurance industry. And if you have a new policy or a clean driving record on an existing policy, my brothers and sisters, uh, for an extended period before 
you have an at fault accident where it's your fault. Some you hit someone or something. That fender bender probably won't cost you a big hit on your insurance bill. As far as they're concerned, it never happened. At least this once. Accidents do happen out there on the road, and the assurance of insurance is a good thing. It is a relief to get forgiveness when we probably don't deserve it. If a big impersonal insurance company can offer grace and mercy, imagine what kind of grace God offers when we have a moral crash. And what if that crash isn't an accident? What happens to us spiritually when we, our failure to stay on the road God has set for us isn't an accident but a willful at-fault violation? What kind of forgiveness, if any, can we expect then? My brothers and sisters, a classic biblical test case is found in 2 Samuel chapter 11. When King David viewed Bathsheba, this fine sister, having a, a shower, a bath on her rooftop, the impending collusion in an adulterous affair was no mere moral fender bender. David's deception, attempted cover-up, and de facto murder of Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, are evidence that David never touched the ethical or moral or spiritual breaks in his situation. His lust clouded his vision to the point that he swerved out of his lane, head on into oncoming traffic, crashing in the same way that his spiritual ancestors before him had done, starting with Adam and Eve. My brothers and sisters, David, like so many of us, preferred to listen to his own voice rather than the voice of God. And when we listen to our voice rather than the voice of God, and our voice is contrary and contra contradictory to the voice of God, my brothers and sisters, we are setting ourselves up for a crash. And it's, a popular, it's popular in some circles these days to see sin as merely a series of mistakes or missteps or accidents that reflect our human imperfections. Biblically speaking, however, sin is more often about choice. God provides the law. God says this is good and this is evil. But then when we decide that we are going to determine what's good and what's evil over against what God has already determined and declared what's good and what's evil, we are setting ourselves up for moral failure. And my brothers and sisters, sin is not merely a legal violation of divine law like speeding or running a red light. The reason that sin is so destructive is that it, it hinders, it hurts our relationship with God. One of my favorite hymns, the hymn writer says, um, I cannot live in sin. And feel a Savior's love. Thy blood can make my spirit clean and write my name above. Because the hymn writer was simply suggesting that if I live in sin, I can't feel a, the Savior's love. And if I can't feel the Savior's love because I'm living in sin, then when Satan self and society tells me that God doesn't love me, I'll start to believe it because I don't feel God's love. But my brothers and sisters, if you don't live in sin, you can feel a Savior's love. And all of us, my brothers and sisters, when we fail to maintain a right relationship with God, need nothing less than a complete beginning. We need God's forgiveness. But first, we need to get clear about what forgiveness means. In their book, The Many Faces or the Faces of Forgiveness, Laron Schultz and Stephen Sandage identify at least three different ways that we can define forgiveness. One definition is forensic or legal forgiveness, the kind of forgiveness that your insurance company wants to give you, or the kind that involves having a debt erased. This is the kind of forgiveness, it's transactional, in which one party agrees not to exact what the law requires. This kind of forgiveness is situational 
and may be limited to one particular incident. Your insurance company uh, forgives your momentary lapse in your driving skill and they won't raise your rates this time. But back into your neighbor's car again. And you'll see that that 70 times 7 forgiveness thing don't apply. That ain't written in your insurance policy. Uh, and, and you know that kind of forgiveness because that's the kind of forgiveness that oftentimes we like to give. You know somebody borrowed $20 from you. Uh, didn't pay you back. And so you let, you let it go. You forgave the debt. But let them come and ask you to borrow some money again. You're not going to give it to them. No, I forgave you that time. But I can't give it to you again. We have a saying that says, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And so my brothers and sisters, we understand that kind of forgiveness, that transactional forgiveness. The kind that only gives you grace once, if that. But then there's a second definition of forgiveness that connects it with a therapeutic benefit. Forgiveness in this sense is a process by which the offended party is motivated to become less vengeful and avoid it and become more benevolent uh, toward the wrongdoer. Forgiveness in this context does not condone the offense or forget about it. Forgiveness is about releasing claim over the offender and moving forward in a different Direction. In other words, I forgive you, but I don't fool with you. Uh, I forgive you, uh, you going right, well I'm going left. That's that kind of forgiveness, and, and we know about that kind of forgiveness too. But my brothers and sisters, that kind of forgiveness doesn't bring about reconciliation or restoration of the broken relationship. That, that requires a whole different level of forgiveness, the kind that only God Almighty can offer. Psalm 51 is attributed to David as have, after his affair with Bathsheba. There's some disagreement among biblical scholars that it was actually David who penned this song. Because the request in verse 18 to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem being cited as evidence of post-exilic authorship. But even if David didn't put pen to parchment to write this psalm himself, the heartfelt cry of this psalm certainly reflects his heart in those days after his failure with Bathsheba. He wasn't seeking a mere free pass for a mistake that he made. Nor was he just wanting God to withhold righteous anger or judgment. My brothers and sisters, David was seeking nothing less than a restoration of the most important relationship in his life. He was seeking what Schultz and Sandage defined as that third type of forgiveness, redemptive forgiveness. My brothers and sisters, accident forgiveness involves a confession of sin. That's what David starts the psalm out with. Uh, when David was confronted by the prophet Nathan in the second Samuel chapter 12, David comes to the heartbreaking realization that his sin was against the Lord. A realization that echoed in Psalm 51. And my brothers and sisters, that doesn't minimize the hurt that he had caused other people. In the, involved in the situation, including Bathsheba, whom he used, and Uriah, whom he killed. But it was simply a recognition that all sin moves us away from God. The psalm then is focused on taking steps towards reconciliation with God, counting on God's steadfast love and mercy to restore that relationship. My brothers and sisters, your insurance company has a long memory when it comes to your last accident. The psalmist asked God not to just forget about this one accident, but to wipe the slate clean altogether. 
And that's the difference between the good hands people and the hand of God. The insurance company does look at your driving record. They want to know if your driving record is good or bad. God doesn't look at our driving record. God already knows that our record is bad. God already knows that our record is jacked up from the floor. Up. That's why the plea is to blot out my transgressions in verse 1. And the repeated references to cleansing throughout the psalm are evidence of the assurance that God's redemptive forgiveness extends far beyond our last sinful act. And my brothers and sisters, that's good news. That when we come to God in confession and repentance, we know that God's primary concern is to reconcile the relationship. God is no divine claims adjuster who raises the cost of our sin with each incident, but instead God will hide God's face from our sins. According to verse 9, they are dumped in the circular file and deleted from the database. Like David, we all still have to deal with the consequences of our action, but God promises, however, that we don't have to carry the guilt. Accident forgiveness involves confession of sin. You got to acknowledge it. You got to deal with it. You got to confess it. You can't walk around like David did for over a year acting like you hadn't done nothing, like your stuff don't stink. No, you have to recognize, like the, the sinner in, 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 in Luke, the publican, when the, 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 the Pharisee and the publican were praying, the Pharisee looked at the publican and said, God, I thank you that I ain't like that sinner. The publican wouldn't even look up towards heaven, but he had his head down and beat on his chest and said, Lord, have mercy on a sinner like me. Too many Pharisees walking around uh, with their nose in the air like they ain't done anything. Like they don't have any gastrointestinal activity, uh, no mucus in their nose. But my brothers and sisters, all of us have some issues and some things in our life, even now. That we need to confess. And if we're going to experience accident forgiveness, it comes with confession of sin. But not only does it come with a confession of sin, accident forgiveness also involves a change in the sinner. Look at verses 10 through 13. My brothers and sisters, we have to recognize that God's purpose of forgiveness is not simple absolution. Let me go to verses 10 and 13 through 13 in the text. Because he says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. My brothers and sisters, the psalmist uh, says that God's purpose of forgiveness is not simple absolution. Awaiting the next time we sin. Redemptive forgiveness is about clearing the way for a renewed and right relationship to take place. A relationship where the joy of God's salvation wins out over the self-serving pleasures of sin. We receive God's grace not as a license to sin even more because we'll be forgiven. We understand that grace and forgiveness are not about transgression. Grace and forgiveness are about transformation. See, if you think grace and forgiveness is about transgression, then you think that it's okay because you're saved and you'll be forgiven to go out and transgress and sin against God. You know that old mentality that says, well, you know what? I'm going to do this and then I'm going to ask for forgiveness later. Well, see, that's not what forgiveness is about. Forgiveness is about transformation, about a willing spirit, a change, and a broken spirit that recognizes our constant dependence on God if I am going to live a victorious life. Redemptive forgiveness enables us to move into a new direction where sin is not in the driver's seat of our lives. 
my brothers and sisters, the story is told of a little girl who accepted Christ as her Savior. She applied for membership in the local church. And they asked her, were you a sinner before you received the Lord Jesus into your life? She said, yes, sir. He said, well, are you still a sinner? And the little girl said, to tell the truth, I feel like I'm a greater sinner than I ever was. The deacon wanted to know, well, then what real change have you experienced, little girl? She said, I don't know how to explain it, except that I used to be a sinner running after sin. But now that I'm saved, I'm a sinner running from sin. And my brothers and sisters, that's the question I have for you this morning. Is that your testimony? Can you identify with this little girl that you used to run to sin? But now you're one who runs from sin. And it's strange how the closer you get to God, the closer we get to Christ, that sometimes we feel like the greatest sinner, just like that little girl. I remember talking to my grandfather about feeling like that. And my granddaddy smiled at me. And he said, son, that's good news. I was confused. I didn't understand. And he said, well, son, that's good. Because when you're living in darkness, you couldn't see the dirt that was on you. But now that you've come into the light, you can see the dirt that's on you. And now that you can see the dirt, you realize how dirty you were. And so you feel dirtier since you've come to Jesus. But my brothers and sisters, don't get discouraged when you see more dirt. Because that just means you're getting closer to the light. And the light exposes the dirt and the sin in our lives. But when there's been a change, when you've confessed the sin, and then there's been a change in your life because of your confession, we can sing like Tremaine Hawkins when she said a change has come over me. Uh, he changed my life and now I'm free. He washed all my sins and he made me whole. And he washed me white as snow he changed my life complete and now i sit at his feet to do what must be done i'll work and work until he comes a wonderful change uh, has come over me my brothers and sisters if you're in Christ Jesus, then guess what? The Bible says that you are a new creature, that all things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. I got a question for you. Are there any new creations out there? If you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, can you wave your hands in the air? And can you give God praise for the change that has come over your life? But my brothers and sisters, let's not keep you too long. I stopped by to tell you about accident forgiveness. Accident forgiveness involves confession of the sinner. It, it, it involves a change in the sinner. But thirdly and finally, my brothers and sisters, accident forgiveness involves confidence in the sovereign. Oh, my brothers and sisters, the psalmist asked God for a lot of stuff in this psalm. From verse 1 all the way through to the end, the psalmist is asking for some stuff that he doesn't deserve. My brothers and sisters, I'll even go a step further and show you that the psalmist 
is not only asking, but he's believing God for everything he asked God to do. My brothers and sisters, he asked God in verse 1 to have mercy on him. He asked him to wash him thoroughly and cleanse him in verse 2. He asked him to purge him with his son. He asked him to let him hear and feel the joy of his salvation. My brothers and sisters, he asked God to hide his face from his sin and blot out his transgression. He asked God to give him a clean heart and renew a right spirit. He asked God not to cast him away and not to take his Holy Spirit from him. He asked God to restore to him uh, the joy of his salvation and sustain a willing spirit in him to deliver him from bloodshed in verse 14. My brothers and sisters, I know that the psalmist believed God for everything that he asked him for because I'm reminded that the writer of Hebrews said in order to come to God we got to believe that God is and you don't believe that God is and call on his name when you call on his name that's evidence that you believe that he is that's why when the atheist says oh my God I say you were an atheist. I guess you are a believer. But my brothers and sisters, the psalmist believed that God existed because he called on him. But not only did he believe that God existed because he called on him, but the writer of Hebrews says that you got to believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And the psalmist, he diligently sought him after his transgression because he understood that he needed divine accident forgiveness. That's what I want to leave you with, church. That whether we follow sin too close, crashed or failed to maintain our lane, or we're driving too fast on the road of sin, Divine accident forgiveness. Our deductible has already been paid. My brothers and sisters, they hung Jesus on an old rugged cross. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. He hung his head. And when you and me, he died. That's love. But guess what? That's not how. The story is, cause three days later, he rose again. That's love. And I want to know, can you give God praise? Because he got up. You can have confidence, and you can get up. But whatever got you down, give God praise right where you are. Say thank you. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. Hallelujah. 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 When you, when you crash, no, don't call 411 pain. When you crash, call on God Almighty. State Farm claims like a good neighbor that State Farm is there. My brothers and sisters, Jesus said that I'm a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And I thank God for accident forgiveness. And if you want accident forgiveness from God Almighty, it's as easy as A, B, C. A, admit you are a sinner in need of a savior. B, believe that Jesus is the Son of God and He lived the life that we should have lived and died the death that we should have died. And that God raised Him from the dead. And 
then see. Confess that belief with your mouth. And the Bible says you shall be saved. That's divine accident forgiveness. Doesn't mean that there won't have to be some repair work done after the accident. But it does mean that the work will be done and you'll be better than before your crash. Is that your testimony? Give your life to Christ and I promise you, I promise your life sometimes, even with Christ, is a bumpy road, but the beauty is that it's always a joy ride. So we offer Christ to you and pray that you have accepted him as your Savior and received divine accident forgiveness. And if you did, would you email us or call us and let us know? And as soon as it's safe to return in this sacred space, we'll baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Amen. Amen, amen. We want to take this opportunity to thank you and give you an opportunity to worship God through giving. If the ministry has been a blessing to you. We ask that you will consider being a blessing to the ministry. The ways of giving are on your screen. And so if you would be so kind so that we can continue to let the world know about divine accident forgiveness so that we can continue to meet the needs and serve this present age our calling to fulfill. We're supporting two elementary schools and their families uh, who are struggling uh, with resources during this pandemic. And it's help from people like you that allow us to do what we do. And so we praise God and thank God for you. Amen, amen, amen. And we're going to get ready now to have our benediction. I want to encourage you to take the Lord with you wherever you go. Let someone know that God loves them and that God desires a relationship with them. Amen. Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for accident forgiveness. We thank you that when we sin, that we can confess our sin and that you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But Lord, when we've experienced accident forgiveness, when we understand the pain that our sin causes us and others, when we understand how our sin grieves the Holy Spirit, it makes it sweeter for us to resist the temptation. It makes it that more bitter when we succumb to the temptation. So I pray, oh God, that you would help us to resist the temptation, that we might enjoy the sweet fellowship of your Holy Spirit that you might continue to rest, rule, and abide in all of us. And now, our strong God, we thank you, we praise you for the blessings of life, this worship experience, what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have felt. We thank you for the privilege to worship you through giving. And we ask that you will bless both the gift and the giver that both will be used for the furtherance and upbuilding of your kingdom. And no one who gave will suffer lack because of that gift. But we'll all find your word to be true. When you said if we bring the tithes into the storehouse, that you'd open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that we would not have room enough to receive. When you said that if we give, it shall be given unto us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into our bosom. When you said you'd meet and supply our every need according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Now our strong God, we ask that you will continue to bless us and keep us. 
Continue to make your face to shine upon us and continue to be gracious unto us. Continue to lift up your countenance upon us and grant us your peace. A peace that the world did not give, but therefore the world can take away. A peace that surpasses all understanding. And a peace that will guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. Now may trouble neglect us. May our neighbors respect us. May angels protect us. And when you call, may heaven accept us. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful week.